Rahul. Um, so, all right. So the talk is uh, about BPF kernel infrastructure. Uh, so I just gave a flash talk uh, at the RE1 for, uh, so, so a bit about me. Uh, I'm a performance engineer at Red Hat team. I basically work at the networking performance team. Um, partly insights, OpenShift, and things like that. Uh, I've been organizing ILEC-D, which is Linux group in Delhi for a while, I think one year. Um, they have been doing very good work. If you are in Delhi, go ahead and do this. Um, so this talk was supposed to be uh, exploring BPF use cases. So that means uh, I'm going to show, uh, I was supposed to show like uh, what all BPF can do, but uh, reviewers and other people helped me realize that uh, not many people understand BPF and know what it is. Um, can, can you start the timer? So I converted that talk to something with, uh, introducing BPF and uh, I wanted to go as deep as possible. So this is an in-depth introduction to BPF. Uh, I'm not going to go over assembly and uh, things like that but uh, as uh, low as uh, system calls. Um, I'll start with uh, BPF, like what exactly BPF is, uh, and then move on to eBPF, uh, why eBPF came across, and talk about something called XTP. If you have attended load balancing talk, I have some surprises for you. Uh, then Q&A, as usual. So, how many people have uh, heard about TCP dump or use TCP dump? Can I see a raise of hands? Awesome, everyone. So what it does is it does packet filtering uh, and it does, it's used for network debugging. It would uh, uh, trace your packets that are coming into kernel and then it would filter that and it returns back to the user space for you to see. So the original TCP dump program uh, used something called BPF. So you have been using BPF without even knowing if you are using TCP dump. BPF is a core that runs TCP dump. Uh, it's a virtual machine that is what uh, doing the packet filtering uh, for TCP dump and it into user space. So what it is, it's a virtual machine and it's inside the kernel. That means it's running inside the kernel. Uh, it has its own custom inst instruction set. That's it. It's a special purpose VM. It's not a general purpose VM. That means it cannot run an operating system, but is used for a specific purpose, that is uh, packet filtering and aggregation. And yeah. So why was TCP dump or BPF created originally? Um, there were many packet filters at that time. Uh, so Van Jacobson, if you're aware, he's one of the people who devised the TCP congestion control algorithms, which probably saved the internet in 1980s, 90s. Um, so the few problems they came across was uh, all the packet filters at that time was very, uh, had very large overhead. That means it has to do a lot of context switches. Say if you're uh, trying to debug a million packet filter flow and then all the packet has to go all the way up to from kernel space to user spin and there, there's a lot of context switches that happen. So that is very expensive. Um, and uh, since it has to travel all the way up from network driver to all the way to user space application where your packet filter is deciding so that it can finally try, try do the filtering, that's very expensive. So the two problem that it solved was BPF was in kernel. That means uh, it's doing, there is no context switches. Uh, the context switches is minimum because it, the only context switches happens, it's for user space to see what's happened. That's the only context switch. And then uh, it's doing uh, the packet filtering at very, very early in the stack. So there is a lot of memory, a lot of processing has been saved. Um, so this is how it looked like. Uh, you have your driver, you have your BPF virtual machine with ha which have its filter and it's inside the kernel. But uh, it, it, it was made for a specific use case. It, it follows the Unix philosophy. Um, the problem uh, was that you have your user space application that is a TCP dump and you write some program in TCP dump and you are putting that program in, inside the kernel and it's running inside the kernel. So you are interacting with the kernel without having to reboot it but you are limited what uh, TCP dump provides. So uh, whatever syntax TCP dump provide, you, are, you have to make do with it. And the instruction set was very limited. 
Um, also, the problem was there was no other API to interact with it. Once the program was in, you cannot do much with it apart from like uh, loading the program with TCP dump. But apart from that, you cannot interact with the program. So with this uh, problems, what was created was eBPF, which is Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, people at Plumgrade, they were working on an SDN product. Uh, they wanted to do, wanted the ability to interact with the packets and things like that. So they uh, enhanced Berkeley Packet Filter to some features. They added some features. So TCP dump was created. I think uh, the paper was back in 1992, which was the time for 32-bit registers and all that. That was a, a huge time for 32-bit. Now it's 64-bit, uh, so they moved to 64-bit and they add a couple of registers. So 10 number registers, it's, they want, what they wanted was they wanted to cover one-to-one -one mapping with x86 instruction set. Uh, so it was inspired from that, so you can have one-to-one -one mapping with that. And JIT support what add, added so that your eBPF uh, code or whatever that is running inside the kernel get directly converted to whatever uh, architecture that you have, say x86, PP64, whatever. And one major thing was a BPF call was added, syscall was added, that means you have a way now to interact with the uh, program that you have loaded. So, what do, so when people say eBPF or BPF, they basically mean eBPF. The original uh, BPF that was used in TCP dump is uh, now in newer kernel, they, uh, it's converted back to eBPF. So there is no original BPF. Whatever you see is eBPF in your newer kernels. Uh, so when people say BPF, it means eBPF or explicitly mentioned, they have to say classic BPF or CBPF for the original BPF. All right, so because of the features of registers, adding registers and 64-bit uh, register support, a lot more uh, use cases uh, kept up. So networking features was the original intention and then uh, tracing came up, then seccom came up and there are people doing a lot of hacking together and uh, bringing up a lot of more use cases. One of my favorite one, uh, if you are, if you attended the load balancing talk, um, Shrey Agarwal mentioned that uh, he he was trying to do. He mentioned that there was no well-known uh, kernel space program to do your load balancing. So with what Facebook is doing is Facebook is using something called XTP for uh, deploying load balancer. It acts as a one-legged load balancer. What it means is that. Uh, usual cases, load balancer require an uh, entire server for doing their work. But in this case, uh, the load balancing program has so less overhead that uh, it's entirely doing everything in kernel. So the server itself can, uh, server itself can be the load balance, uh, useful load balancing itself. So Facebook has already deployed it on their uh, data centers and are seeing significant improvement performance. Um, Cloudflare is also using in for DDoS production, and another favorite is Celium. I came to know that uh, DigitalOcean was using Celium for the Kubernetes purposes. Um, all right, so let's take a look at how it works. I might be going a bit fast from now. Um, so how it uh, the uh, general architecture looks like? I will explain each and each of the components. So you have a user space program that you will write in the user space like uh, Python, C, or whatever. And then it will be compiled to eBPF bytecode using LLVM. So LLVM has its support. And then you will use the BPF system call that I just mentioned to load the program. And then you have a verifier. So running inside a kernel is not considered safe. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, error-prone situation. So you have something called a verifier that makes sure that your program is safe. I'll talk about it. And then you have a virtual machine uh, and then how it works is it has a couple of hooks. So how uh, hooks into the net, uh, into the subsystem, kernel networking subsystem. Net, not networking, but uh, the subsystem, kernel subsystem. So let's say you have your kernel code, and if that code is tra uh, traversed, you will have your BPF program executed at that time. And that BPF program will be run inside the virtual machine, and then you whatever you want to do, uh, it, it will do that. And then uh, if you want to interact with the user user space and the kernel space. Um, you have something called eBPF maps. Maps is uh, data structures, I'll talk about it also, which lets you interact with the user space and the kernel space in uh, uh, having a user space program uh, and lets you interact with the kernel space. So it's a two-way communication. 
Um, so the BPF system call looks something like this. It lets you have the ability to load the program um, and create maps, which are data structures. Um, and it will take attributes for what the program types are and what the map types are, it's, since it's a data structure uh, size and all that stuff. Um, so maps are basically data structures, again. Uh, it's a key value pair. Uh, so it will have uh, hash types, uh, per CPU arrays, perf arrays, uh, lots of things, histograms, lots of things. Um, so it returns a file descriptor back to the program in the user space program. So you can use that file descriptor to in, uh, interact with the kernel, kernel space program that you have just loaded. And uh, it provides some kernel, uh, in-kernel helper function. These functions are implemented in kernel. I'll talk about it also. Uh, one thing is that you can have uh, multiple maps for each program, and each, pro uh, each program can access multiple maps. Uh, all right, so map types are just mentioned. You have uh, hash, arrays, per perf event array, things like that, stack. Um, so you, ha you access your map uh, with proper functions, since it's very hard to do with the, uh, directly with dbpf. Uh, these are just helper functions to create the map in Internally, it com com uh, compiles down to the BPF syscall that I've just shown. And uh, the attribute that it takes are like map type, key size, and all that stuff, which will be supplied to the BPF system call. Uh, all right. And then you have your helper function to do operations on the map. So this is, user this is a user space program. And the map is residing in the kernel. And you are accessing the map on from a user space program. Um, all right, so the helper functions are there to ease out the tasks that can be considered hard with eBPF. So you don't want to do a lot of assembly instruction, assembly code or the instruction that eBPF VM has. You don't want to do that. Do that. So that's why it's a bit hard and people have implemented a lot of internal helper functions. Um, so as mentioned, there are a couple of uh, program types. So each program with specific use cases, such as XTP is one use case, uh, C group SOC has, is another use case. Each will have uh, their hook into some subsystem which uh, they want to connect to. And uh, whenever that hook, uh, whenever that code tra travels, the, co the BPF program is run. And it's running inside the VM. So the program types are SOC, socket filter. You also get to interact with the traffic classifier, perf event. Yeah. Um, loading the program, you again have a wrapper function. Uh, so th there is a library called libbpf inside the kernel, which uh, which which eases out, which provide this uh, wrapper functions to ease out the task. Um, the struct that a struct looks like this. You have an instruction count. So there is a limitation with BPF on the amount uh, number of instructions that you can run, which is I think four uh, K bytes, four K instructions. Um, but with pseudo program or root, root access, you can do as much as 1 million uh, instructions. You need to write this program in GPL licenses. And you need to specify the kernel version so that you can uh, use what, what, all, what features are available with the kernel. So uh, it's running inside the kernel. So it will, will you consider it safe? I don't think so. Uh, it's running inside a VM? Still no. So that's, that's where Verify comes in. It ensures that there is a memory safety and uh, the program is terminated safely. There are a couple of stages of eBPF Verifier. So the first stage is it does a DAG check, which means that it checks for the con uh, control flow and ensures that there are no loops. The program terminates uh, definitely. And it checks for, un the next stage is for checking uh, registers and uh, stack changes. It's, it's what it tried to do that it's, it will simul simulate the entire uh, execution and it, it will try to see uh, if, we are trying, if, if the program is trying to do maybe an unreachable instruction or trying to read from an uninitialized register or in secure mode if, if it's trying to do some point arithmetic. And uh, memory access, in out-of-bound memory access, it will check. Um, so it will complain all the time. It's, it's, it's a very complaining thing. So you need to ensure that if you're writing a BBF program, you need to ensure that you do your checks correctly on your, on your user, space pro, user space program itself. Uh, check all the register and check all the return value that it's uh, doing. So the, I hope the uh, architecture is uh, clear now. So 
how will you use uh, EPPF? I mentioned a lot of assembly and instruction, all that stuff. C, it seems to be very complex. So first thing you need to ensure that you need to have your updated uh, kernel version, uh, get the latest one and uh, enable the kernel configs as present here. Um, why I need to, why you uh, guys need to have uh, updated kernel version because the features are added in stages. Uh, people are coming with, up with more uh, features day by day because it's an active area of development. Um, the original classic BPF looks something like this. You have uh, your TCB dumb program that uh, is listening on some interface on port 22 and the program would look something like this. This is a C program like fragment. Um, and then you will load the program with uh, assert attach filter and uh, yeah, it will load the program. It's it's doing what the TCP dumb program is doing exactly. But you don't want to, it doesn't make sense for anyone to write this. So you have your EPPF instructions. Again, you don't want to write this. So LLVM added support for BPF. So there is an EPPF compiler in the backend for LLVM. Uh, you are able to write a subset of C. You can write C program to load the program. So what this program is doing is exactly the same as this one. Uh, it's it's doing a lookup, and you have even even more uh, tools to ease out the development. There are BCC tools. BCC tools are uh, libraries that allow you to write your program much more e is ease than uh, writing uh, assembly instructions or things like that. Um, so BPF program, uh, BCC program looks something like this. Uh, you have some inline code for running your application, which will do the tracing or net if in case of networking, you can do that. And for processing your data, you can use the Python or Go or pretty much, I think Rust, Lua, lots of languages right now supporting. Um, the map creation is much more simpler here. You just uh, tell what maps you need and you, you will get that, and you uh, do the formatting afterwards. So the tool set with BCC are increasing day by day. Uh, I can show some examples for this. Let's say you want to do virtual file system. What you can do is uh, you can see what, what all the virtual file system are doing read operations. Um, so what it it's a tracing example. So it would trace the VFS read function call so it's tracing, it would take some time. So I can stop whenever I want. So if you are running some application and uh, you want to check whether at this particular time, uh, what's the VFS read doing, how many uh, time it taking. So you can run at specific interval and uh, specify your control C. I can hit control C at any time and end the program. So in this case, you can see there is a histogram. Um, so it enables you to find uh, where the outliers are. Mean, meaning that uh, if some application is taking a lot of time, in this case, there is one count, there is one function call that is taking like four microseconds to eight microseconds. And rest of the applications are working perfectly, 865 major one. So you can do that. So another uh, tra uh, networking example I can give is uh, TCP drop. So the thing is that many people can uh, write their program on their own. So all these programs are, I think, close to 200 to 300 uh, lines of code. And uh, may, uh, most of it is like command line processing because it's a command line application. You have your passing, argument processing, and things like that. So your logic is uh, very less and you can write, you know, replacement for S trays and all, F trays and all that things. Uh, due to the limitation, I'm not talking about those tools as of now. Um, so TCP drop is not mentioned here because people are developing tools every day. Uh, the feature for TCP drop is that uh, it tracks something, uh, it tracks a function called TCP hyphen drop. It was added in Linux 4.8 recently. So that means uh, if, you, if you find a function that you want to trace, you can do that easily. So it will do some network uh, tr uh, stack tracing and you, the good thing about BPF is that you can access the kernel data structures as it is. So as in this case, you have a socket state. For now, it's closed. So even if you don't understand this, uh, if your application are receiving some drops, and you can at least try to see what's what has led to these drops. For example, in this case, this uh, layer 3 is working fine. We have something in layer 4, and the drop is happening at this stage. 
because it's this is a function that called TCP drop, and then you can slowly trace back to where exactly the problem occurred. So this is a very good tracing tool that uh, people just uh, write whenever use cases are coming up. All right. So even more easier way to write BPF program is via BPF trace. BPF trace is a high level DSL. That means uh, like MySQL you have from star select statement. BPF trace also helps you with uh, writing e uh, help you with uh, easing your ability to write eBPF program. So in this case you have your one liners, uh, and you can in this in this case you are uh, trying to trace the enter system call and trying to count how many has happened. You can even write in the scripting manner so that you can do much more formatting for the user use for the use of user. And if you're aware of system tab, it's supposed to be a very uh, widely used tool for kernel tracing and kernel uh, debugging. Uh, but it's supposed, it's, it supposedly crashes a lot of, of your kernel. You cannot use this on production. It's very uh, dangerous, you can say. Um, so with uh, the three, version 3 or 2 release, uh, system tab now, now supports BPF internally. So whatever system tap instruction is uh, created, it's, it will now run inside a virtual machine. So it's much more safer. All right. So the next segment is uh, XTP. I, uh, I'll just mention uh, that I'll be working. Uh, I was working with XTP at Red Hat for a while. And we were able to do a couple of tests. Uh, and I'll show this now. Um, so a brief is that XTP is a hook of eBPF, so that means it's an eBPF program, which the hook that, where the hook exists, is it's very early in the network stack. So it's right, it's straight out of the driver. That means when the driver receives the packets, the uh, XTP program kicks in. So what it allows is it allows you to do very fast packet processing. So in the industry, uh, load balancing talk, you, uh, if you are able to use XTP with uh, for your load balancing purposes, as, men, as uh, I talked about that Facebook is using, you can get much more than 80K TPS without having to crash your systems. Um, so how it works is you have your general packet processing at layer four, which is the IP tables, it's, uh, layer three, which is the IP tables. Uh, so if, you, if let's say you have to, you have a packet which is supposed to be dropped. Um, so it doesn't have to travel all the way up to uh, layer three like creating SK buff, you have extra memory, you have extra processing that needs to be done. If we can drop the packet simply right here in the XTP, in the XTP hook, we can directly drop that program. So it would save a lot of memory and a lot of processing. That's the idea of XTP. All right, so the good thing about XTP is it doesn't bypass the network stack, meaning that you have whatever the kernel stack security with you. And uh, the packet that, uh, if you don't know what to do with the packet, it would just uh, return the packet back to the kernel. Um, it doesn't take over the whole NIC. You can design the XTP program as per queue also. There is development happening. Um, so what it means is that it uh, you can still use the NIC. So other fast data path uh, programs basically take over the NIC and you cannot use it. Maybe it's not even shown in the network uh, kernel statistics also. But in this case, you can with XTP, you don't have that. Uh, it's part of the uh, kernel tree. That means there will be more support with vendors. Peop Netronome al al already supports offloading uh, BLNXT, lots of network uh, vendors also al already supporting many features, even when it was uh, just starting to grow. And uh, you have a couple of actions. So as to mimic IP tables filtering capability, IP tables also have accept uh, and things like that. You have uh, something called drop. Yeah, so if packet is not supposed to be on a system, you will just drop it. It's supposed to be transmitted. Uh, it would just transmit out the same way it came across. It needs to be directed. It can be directed from one interface to another interface. And you don't know what to do, you just abort it or pass it to the kernel stack to do the processing. All right, you have a two way to load the program. As mentioned, you have a user space program to interact, interact with the kernel space program, which is the EPPF program that is running inside the VM. Um, and you have another IP route two program that can help you to load the program at this also. Um, all right, so XTP in real life, uh, we were able to test out some scenario 
and uh, trying to at performance team we were trying to test out its limit. Uh, this is very initial test, so numbers can vary a lot uh, in the later stage because XTP is an active area of development. Uh, so DDoS, we were able to test uh, a DDoS a certain DDoS scenario. So we were able to compare it with IP tables, which is the existing uh, network filter. Uh, IP tables is actually using the NetFilter backend because it's uh, the latest kernel. It's by default, it's using the network NetFilter backend, which is also an internal implementation. Um, the system we had uh, was on uh, two NICs with uh, 40 gigs capability. Uh, the kernel was 4.18. So our test uh, setup looks something like this. We have two systems connected back to back. They are connected via wires. Um, we have uh, two flows that are bi-directional. That means both the interfaces are sending traffic. What you have is you have your TCP flow, that is 90% of the stream, and you have your UDP flow. What we are doing on the device under test is we have a network filter. One time we will load the XTP program, and then at the other time we will load the IP tables program and do the filtering. We will simply drop the IP tables uh, TCP uh, protocol packets uh, and pass the UDP packets. And at the traffic generator side, we'll measure that how many packets of UDP have we got. So we have certain criteria if for the test to pass. We have ensure that only 0.002% of drop UDP packets have been dropped and no TCP packets are received on the interface. So one by one, we load the program. And uh, these are the results for single queue. So what that means is single queue means you whatever packets you receive will be processed by only single CPU. Um, so with IP tables, we have raw mode, which is the fastest one, uh, which kicks in very early. So with IP tables raw mode, we were able to see close to 2 million packets per second. This is million packets per second. And with XTP, we are able to see 5.6, so, which is a great gain uh, when we try to test out the DDoS scenario. And if you want to see scalability, uh, IP tables does perform, in, perform, a, uh, perform a lot, but uh, uh, XTP, because of the simple idea of uh, processing your packets very early in the network stack, uh, it, it is very fast. With offloading support, it's, it's breaking barriers uh, way high with SmartNICs coming up with Netronome and all that uh, vendors. Um, so one interesting thing is that uh, there is a BPF filter branch in the kernel's, uh, kernel Git tree. So the work that is happening there is IP tables is supposed to be replaced. So the newer implementation is NetFilter, that is I think 2016 if I'm not wrong, but still people are still using uh, IP tables and uh, Kubernetes has like a lot of problem with IP tables when you have like 1,000, 100,000 rules of IP tables. So with uh, BPF, it's, it's trying to solve that problem, but you have that with IP tables, rule will now be converted into BPF rules internally. So there will be no NetFilter um, so imagine if uh, it's if it's added support for XTP. So XTP, we uh, as we've seen, the results are just staggering. So with this, we can see that uh, IP tables will have a lot of performance gain in the future. Um, offloading support is there. You can check out this net, uh, Netronome blog. They did a few tests with the offloading, and yeah. So BPF is exciting. The future is exciting. Uh, many people have been using it apart from networking and tracing use cases such as uh, this research paper presented at LinuxCon. Um, if you're aware of Fuse file system, Gluster, Ceph, uh, things like that. So the, these programs are a user space file system. So that means it has a lot of overhead of context switches. So somebody tried to do a research with eBPF. The they, what they did was, why don't we do the operation in the kernel, in, in kernel only with eBPF. So, they were able to see a lot of performance gain because of context switches. Um, and then you can use uh, uh, BPF in Android since uh, Android has a Linux kernel, but it's not safe to directly do changes in it. So what people are doing is you can extend the kernel, version, kernel features with the eBPF and do whatever you want to do. It's, it's, it's free to do. So uh, I'm reaching the end of my talk. I'm Way ahead of time. Um, with so, you if you want to do like uh, develop your own uh, tools and develop your own BPF uh, programs, you can 
uh, you need to have your updated kernel and you can play around with the BCC tools to ju just, uh, I just showed you some of the tools such as function latency. There are a lot of tools. So you can even trace your uh, user space program. If you're aware of kprobes, uret probes, USDT, all of these programs can be used. These are all existing kernel infrastructure. There is minimal reinventing the wheel. People are using the existing, existing in, in the kernel infrastructure to do their tracing and other things. With XTP, you can write your programs and you can uh, uh, play with it if you want. Uh, so a couple of resources to take a look. Uh, if you search for BPF on the internet, internet you, get, you will get a lot of resources, but this compilation have uh, many presentation talks, uh, documentation, uh, blogs, a lot of things. So you can take a look at this also. All right. Thanks so much. Do we have Thank questions? You, uh, if anybody has questions, they can raise their hands and ask questions. Okay, yeah, we have one. Wait, let me come. I see that you did benchmarking with uh, IP tables. Uh, have you considered benchmarking with NF tables, which I believe is a lot more performant, given the so fact that... So, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, given the fact it has data structures like sets and stuff, isn't it? So, this is 4.18, right? So, as I mentioned, it's using net filters as a backend. Okay. NF tables, yeah. Oh, so it's using NF tables, yeah. is it not IP tables? So, oh, if you, basically you have a parameter to change whether you want NF table backend or IP tables backend. Oh. So, with the newer kernels, by default, NF tables. Okay. So this is the internal incrementation that you're talking about. Oh, okay, I mentioned. It. And here. second question I had was, uh, what is IP tables and IP tables raw in one of the slides that you have? So, had. all right. So, what you have is uh, in, with IP tables you have five tables: raw, filter, mangle, all that. So one of the table is raw. So the raw mode actually kicks in very early. It doesn't. It it comes in very early than connection tracking bridge. Not bridge checking, but yeah, it's it comes in early, very early. So, if you have to do the drop, it can be done very early. So, I just wanted to give a because XDB has an you know, anyways have an edge because it's running a, a very early. So that's why I was trying to do with raw modes. But the what is it? Yeah, the general mode, which is a filter mode, is the one with 1.33 million packets per second. 